Mark's interests as an author and historian lie in musicians and stories that have been lost, forgotten, or overlooked in the annals of jazz. Uh, please welcome Mark Miller. Thank you, Beth. And uh, allow me to be the first from this stage to extend congratulations to Beth and Richard on their new venture. May it be uh, long and may it be successful. And thank you for making Way Down That Lonesome Road one of the projects for this inaugural season. The subtitle of this book is Ronnie Johnson in Toronto, 1965 to 1970. And it's what I would call a biographical study rather than a um, biography per se. And it's based on the premise that from the timeline, uh, 1965 to 1970, there are still people around, um, especially in Toronto, who knew Ronnie Johnson. And um, it made it possible to reclaim him. Um, and he is one of the, the great early figures of jazz and blues from the 1920s. But it's possible to kind of reclaim him from the realm of legend and mythology. Uh, that's, you know, where most of his contemporaries have, have gone to rest. Reclaim him and kind of bring him back to life through the recollections of the people who knew him. You know. So I'm going to read um, essentially the first chapter, which is called An Authentic Living Legend. And that's a quote from a review of uh, his very first performance in Toronto. Ronnie Johnson would have had little reason to pause at the top of the half dozen steps down to the new gate of Cleve. Little reason, say, perhaps to double check the street number of the Avenue Road Coffee House, 45A, and, ever a man with an eye for the female form, to glance at the dresses on display in the window of Couturier Lino Lascelles' Maison Française, upstairs, at 45. Summer dresses, in fact although summer itself was still a month away on this mild evening, the third Thursday of May 1965. No, Johnson would have had little reason to expect that the next four nights at the new gate of Cleve might be much different than many of the other engagements that he'd taken in a career of more than 50 years. Little reason to think that this engagement might, in fact, be a turning point in his life. True, he could not have anticipated how few people would come to hear him. The new gate of Cleve was only in its third week at its Avenue Road address, and its young owners seemed not to appreciate the significance of their latest attraction. They had advertised the rhythm and blues sounds of Lonnie Johnson in the Toronto Telegram that day, a description that referred to what was perhaps the least of Johnson's many accomplishments as a singer and guitarist in the recorded history of blues and jazz. A description, moreover, that made him appear to be an even greater anomaly than he really was among the folk and blues acts that usually performed at the club. But Johnson had faced small audiences before. Indeed, there had been times when he faced no audiences at all, times when he was forced to work outside of music, taking care not to harm his hands, even as he subjected them, subjected them to necessity to the perils of manual labor. Those times were over. Johnson had been making his living as, again as a musician ever since our radio announcer in Philadelphia, Chris Albertson, found him in 1960, employed locally as a janitor. Johnson quickly resumed his recording career and began appearing in night spots as different as the Playboy Club in Chicago and Gerd's Folk City in New York's Greenwich Village. A tour in Europe with other blues greats followed late in 1963. Johnson also visited Canada that year, working in the Hamilton at the Downstairs on King Street West for four nights over the Easter weekend. He'd likely crossed the border at least once before, appearing in the early 1920s with the vaudevillians Glenn and Jenkins at the Orpheum Theatres in Winnipeg and Vancouver. But Canadian cities were not routinely on the circuit traveled by veteran bluesmen until the 1960s, when the survivors among them, most, like Johnson, newly rediscovered, were drawn into the revival of American folk music more generally and put their place at festivals and in clubs 
alongside veteran white traditionalists and younger white singers and songwriters. So it was that Johnson had shared a bill at Gerd's Folk City in March 1965 with the young Canadian singer Bonnie Dobson, whose song Morning Dew was just then capturing the fancy of her contemporaries. And so it was that Johnson followed Toronto's Gordon Lightfoot and a New York couple, Richard and Mimi Farina, into the new gate of clues. Lightfoot's first single, I'm Not Saying, had just been released. Lightfoot and the Farinas were only weeks away from their debut appearances at the important Newport Folk Festival in Rhode Island. The old gate of Cleve, as it were, had operated for a year or so at 161 DuPont Street. Several blocks to the north of the new location, a few more blocks to the west, and altogether too many blocks from the Yorkville scene that had lately centralized around the intersection of Yorkville Avenue proper and Avenue Road. Yorkville in 1965, and for a few years before and after, served Toronto much as Greenwich Village served New York, and Haight Ashbury served San Francisco. A neighborhood where members of the hippie counterculture of the day lived, worked, and played. Musicians, painters, writers, draft resistors, runaway teens, and social activists, all in their way trying to change the world. Or if not the world, at least their world. Yorkville was comparatively small by New York and San Francisco standards, residential in design and Victorian in detail, reflecting its origins as a mid-19th century village on what at the time were the northern outskirts of Toronto. Several of its coffee houses offered music within a stroll of no more than a minute or two from the Newgate of Cleve, including the Riverboat, El Patio, Penny Farthing, Mouse Hole, and others east along Northville, and the Half Beat, Purple Onion, Devil's Den, and Village Corner up and down Avenue Road. That is, a stroll of no more than a minute or two when the sidewalks were clear of the teenagers who flocked to the village, as it was known, from other parts of the city every night. Hundreds of kids, as Sheila Gormley described them in the Toronto Telegram that summer, jammed together and moving down the street like a cockeyed centipede. Came Saturday night, cars on Yorkville Avenue could take 20 minutes to inch along the two relatively short blocks from Bay Street west to Avenue Road, there to, to turn south to Bloor Street, then east back to Bay, there to begin the crawl again. The crush of people on the sidewalks did not spill over, however, into the new gate of Cleve, whose slow start in its first few weeks at its new address was a portent of its struggle to stay open in face of Yorkville's move away from folk, blues, and jazz to rock, a struggle that the room lost, lost in less than a year. After it reopened in May 1966 as Boris's, it was home to a succession of the city's better mock bands, notably the Ugly Ducklings, Luke and the Apostles, and Kensington Market. For the moment, though, Richard and Mimi Farina sang at the gate to an audience of six during a set reviewed by Sid Edelman for the New York showbiz tabloid Variety. Lonnie Johnson had two listeners fewer when Patrick Scott, the jazz critic for the Golden Mail, stopped by the following week. When I departed, an hour later, his audience had doubled, Scott reported with evident satisfaction. And I had heard a performance so profoundly moving that its memory will haunt me forever. Scott was a crusty old-school journalist of the H.L. Mencken persuasion, reviled by local and visiting musicians alike for the blunt, often dismissive, and occasionally vicious tone of his reviews. But he also had his favorites, as Johnson, an authentic living legend, was from the very first. I am about to use the word I try to employ more sparingly than any other in my vocabulary, Scott announced in his report from the Nugget of Cleve, alluding to his customary severity as a critic, by way of prefacing his assertion that Johnson was nothing less than an artist. To which Scott added proudly, and I regard it as an honor to have heard him. The honor was ultimately shared by just a few others at the gate, although their number included a future rock star, then still in his teens, the guitarist and singer Neil Young, and a British jazz aficionado in his early 30s, John Norris, 
who managed the jazz, blues, and folk department at Sound the Record Man on Young Street, and edited Coda magazine, then in its seventh year. Norris would devote his life quietly and conscien conscientiously to jazz, putting the integrity of the music on its own terms before all other considerations. While Young's reaction to Johnson's performance has gone unrecorded, Norris suggested in Coda magazine that, Patrick Scott to the contrary, those in attendance at the gate who remember Johnson for the fine blues he used to sing were in for a shock as this whole act was geared to that of cabaret show. Norris described Johnson's voice as strong and his guitar work as really good, but noted that when he did sing the blues, it was without any kind of conviction or feeling, and added that a certain sameness pervaded the entire performance. By the time Norris's dissenting opinion appeared in the June-July issue of Quota magazine, however, Johnson had returned for a month at the Penny Farthing, an engagement that was as triumphant as his four nights at the new gate of Cleveland had been disappointing. No matter that Johnson had a young daughter back in Philadelphia, he rarely left Toronto again. Thank you.